minutes. Thanks for the introduction, by the way. Um, and as you already mentioned, I work for Babylon. Babylon is a healthcare startup um, here in London. Um, and today I'm going to talk about distributed representations. And I mentioned a bit on how they, how they work with chatbots um, and how they're basically a really nice tool for, to, to, to sort of understand what the, what, the, what the people are telling machines. Um, right. So um, I wouldn't be really from a startup if I wouldn't start with like some sort of ambitious vision. Um, so Babylon has this vision of putting an accessible and affordable healthcare service into the hands of everybody on, on Earth. Right. So this is obviously ridiculously ambitious. Um, and uh, it won't simply work by taking a lot of doctors and putting them in a room and putting them on Skype. Um, so you need to be much more clever um, in how you manage the doctors, how you manage access to the services of the doctors, how, you can, uh, how can you reliably say if a patient doesn't need to see a doctor, uh, things like that. Um, so there's a, the whole company is a, has a big push towards developing this technology that, that, that allows us to sort of semi-automate primary care. Um, on one hand in the UK, but also in other countries like, uh, for example, we're based in Rwanda as well. Um, so, so if you want to automate primary care, it makes sense to look at what a doctor actually does, right? And um, we, we sort of have a skewed perception of that um, because a lot of the things that a doctor does are actually very simple for us. So from a machine's point of view though, um, these very, very simple skills like understanding what you say and um, having a conversation with you and like, visually inspecting what's wrong with you um, are nearly a bit harder than the ones that we normally associate with a doctor, which is that the doctor knows your history, has some medical prior knowledge, and that they can reason about diseases and symptoms and so forth. Um, so I don't want to say we're not interested in diagnosis, right? So we put a lot of emphasis and uh, a lot of resources into development of diagnostic systems at Babylon, uh, which is something we're very interested in. But day to day, it's just, if you look at a doctor, it's relatively little of his time is spent uh, actually diagnosing. From a machine's point of view, actually, this guy is already nearly there, right? So, <laughs> the medics know, never like that when I show that slide. Um, so, the, he already has managed to gain all the sort of standard skills that we need, so he can understand language, can see everything. We just need to instill a little bit of medical knowledge into him, and then he will be a doctor. Right? Um, the same also holds, though, for, for like lawyers and scientists and pretty much any, any profession that doesn't require some sort of manual skill. Um, from a machine's point of view, they all sort of share these sort of same challenges, right? And that is a good thing, because uh, this means that a lot of people are actually working on these aspects, uh, so language understanding, computer vision, and so forth. And you've seen some examples in the last talk, I believe. Um, the first three of these um, are actually clearly, at the moment at least, in the domain of deep learning. So the, the <laughs> Uh, who here is familiar with, with deep learning? Oh, that's oh, quite a few. All right, you might be bored. <laughs> um, uh, so these three skills are sort of the, the, the best approach that we know is to use deep learning on them, so to use deep learning for text understanding and for computer vision and so forth. Um, they're still far from being solved, though. Even though they, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are amazing things that people do. Um, they're amazing results. Um, but overall, the problem is still far from being solved. Um, and in digital health, uh, or in nearly any sort of application domain of machine learning, we need to understand how we can take these advances from uh, these sort of more technical or more specific applications of deep learning and transfer them to like our, our domain. And um, to, to like sort of get you into, um, or to demonstrate what I believe is sort of the best method of doing that, um, I want to quickly revisit on what I believe actually makes a deep neural network work well. Okay. So let's start. <coughs> so hmm. this is like a standard neural network, right? So there's three layers. Input is where you put our data. Uh, there's a hidden layer. And then the output is where we get our results, right? And there are, this is the, obviously the simplest possible way of displaying this. But there could be some arbitrary sort of connectivity be between uh, many different layers, many different types of layers. Um, one example how this can be used is, for example, we take um, a lot of pictures of um, cats and dogs or something. Um, and we want to train the network to predict if it shows a cat or a dog. So far, so good. Um, and what we need to do in order to do that is to, to train the network by showing it a lot of examples. So we show it millions of examples. For everyone, we tell them if it shows a cat or a dog. So far, so good. Nothing magic there. Um, 
but you all probably know that there's something going on in here that, that makes them work much better than other stuff. And we don't really understand what it is, but there's something that is going on in these, in these hidden layers that actually make them work much better than other methods that people use. So what do they actually do, right? So you can think of a neural network like this, or as I say, any sort of arbitrary connectivity with more layers, as like a sequence of two things. The first is a sort of complex nonlinear transformation of your input, and which feeds into this sort of simple linear decision model that is in the end. And this is really, really simple. So it's like logistic regression, basically, in the last layer if you, if you have a classification problem. So when we train a network, initially it would be pretty rubbish at the task that we wanted to do. Right? Um, and during training, we sort of heavily penalize it. So we basically put it under a lot of stress. We showed a lot of examples, and we showed a lot of things that it should do. Um, and it really wants to reduce the stress that it's under and minimize sort of the cost that we associate with its output. Um, and since the, the, decision, uh, the decision part is so simple, the only thing it can really do is over time to make these representations uh, much more powerful. Oh. So I got word wanting to update at the best times. Um, so over time, we basically force the network to adjust the transformation of the input data in a way that makes it easier for the decision model to do its job. And that's sort of over the past decade of machine learning research, I'd say the sort of one of the main insights into why these are interesting, right? Um, it's actually, even if we have something that works really well for prediction, um, the task might be so specific that it's useless for anybody else. But the, the fact that is, it is able to do this prediction has something to do with this complex linear transformation that we can actually extract and use for other purposes. So you can think of the hidden layer um, as producing a vector representation for an input. For most of you, that probably won't be a surprise. Um, so let's say I put an image, image at the input. Then uh, I can look at all the units in my, my, my hidden layer and say, or in my last hidden layer, for example, um, and treat them as one vector. Right? Um, basically, just along this numbers. So during training, we force the network to arrange things that are similar into similar positions in this sort of high dimensional vector space. So you can think of it like, the, like a map, right? If, if I, in my cat and dog example, um, if the network is really good at classifying pictures of cats and pictures of dogs, it will have somehow learned to separate images of cats in this high dimensional representation from other pictures, for example, of, so these are dogs actually. Um, there are no cats in here, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it turns out that neural networks are really good at this. They're really good at arranging similar things in similar, uh, in similar locations in these high dimensional vector representations. And um, this can also give us some sort of insight as to why deeper networks tend to work better in many applications. So let's say I have a fixed architecture. Then I, I sort of impose a limit on how much the network can transform the input in this representation such that it's easier for the decision model to decide. So in many cases, it just won't work because it just doesn't have enough flexibility to arrange the things in a way that it would like it to arrange. Um, and one way to easily expand on the capability of arranging things is by adding another layer. Automatically, we will, we will sort of make it easier for the model to discover transformations that are better to represent the input for the decision model. So, but we can't obviously do this for images only. We can also do this for other types of data. Um, so, um, so applied to language, this idea has already led to like a small revolution in like natural language processing. Um, and we saw that uh, the, as long as the, the network is good at the task that it's trained for and the task is sort of sensible, it, it nearly doesn't matter what task we use in order. Uh, we will always sort of get some sort of, in a sense, useful hidden representation in our, of our network. So, um, Applied to language, you can just define like a very simple task, right? This is just like a toy problem. Um, we want to classify whether a sequence of words is sort of sensible or if it's nonsensical. So if, for example, the cat set on the mat is sensible and the cat few on the mat is not really sensical, right? And we just want to build a network that can predict exactly this yes or no. Um, the way we do that is a very, a very simple model. So um, we start by looking at all our vocabulary of words and we assign one vector uh, initially a random vector to, to each and every one of the words in our vocabulary. Um, and these are usually represented as like a matrix and each row of the matri matrix is like one, represents one word. Um, 
then given sort of five words, we sort of build a simple model that concatenates them, for example, or uh, there are other ways of combining them as well. Um, and then that which feeds into like a very simple decision part that just decides if it's true or if it's false. Right? Um, and the, 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 the important thing is that the task is sort of useless. Right? Nobody needs a classifier that tells me if a, f if five, a sequence of five words is sensible or not. Nobody really needs that. But what it, the, the crucial thing is that we can, with this simple toy task, uh, get easy, it, that it's very easy to get millions and millions of training examples um, from online data sources such as Wikipedia and so forth. <laughs> so, and you probably all heard of word to vec GLOV, FastText, all these sort of different methods. Um, they all sort of share at least some aspects of this approach, that you have some sort of simple task and uh, um, that you just exploit to learn good representations. So what, is it actually, what actually happens if you train this? So let's say you have a sentence, the cat's sat on the mat, right? Uh, and I, uh, I look at just the word sat, then they are just a sort of finite number of words that I can put into that spot such that the sentence still makes sense, right? So for example, the, the cat lay on the mat, the cat slept on the mat, the cat jumped on the mat, blah, 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 so forth. Um, and the only way the, the, the model can really solve this task of predicting whether this is a correct sentence or not is by, by making sure that all the words that would fit in there um, get a similar vector representation, right? Otherwise, it can't decide it. And that leads to this sort of interesting property that words that have a similar context will obtain a similar re vector representation. But there's more. Um, to many of you, this won't come as a surprise. But um, so this is a picture from 2013. Uh, from a paper from Thomas Mikulov, very seminal work. Um, and what it shows is for um, words that describe countries and words that describe uh, capitals, um, it's a projection down to the first two principal components. Um, and what you see is that it sort of learned a systematic relationship between uh, languages on the left and uh, capitals on the right. So what I mean by that is if you start at Poland, for example, and look at the, the relation it is in with Warsaw, then you see that it's kind of the same as Russia to Moscow. So I could take this vector and apply it to this guy, and I would sort of end up in a similar region to Moscow. And that's really amazing, right? So the, the, um, only by looking at a whole lot of text, I mean, it's a lot of text, but still, only by looking at a lot of text, the network learned something about the world around us, sort of. You know, it learned, it learned actually to make sense of some things and put things into an order that uh, is actually useful to us. Um, and what is great for us is that we can simply, uh, let me go back. So these representations, so basically these, these rows in these matrices, after training, we can just take them out, right, and use them for other things. Um, and the key thing of these word to vec models is that you just basically throw away this part, and never use it again, and you're just interested in these word vectors. So um, I will, oh, I'll promise you a chatbot demo. So, um, so I want to give you a quick sort of feel for how this looks in practice, uh, how, you can, how, how you can use these distributed representations to actually make things sort of sensible, right? Um, and this is basically a very simplified explanation of how the chapel works that we build at Babylon, even though it's, it's in practice it's much, a bit more complicated. But um, nevertheless, let's give it a try. So let's say you want to build a very simple chatbot that um, um, where you want to, to answer questions to medical questions with medical content that you have on file, right? So you know, for example, it's, if somebody says, I have a headache, I want to run them through like some, a, a, a little bit of uh, like a decision tree sort of questions, or I want to just give them some information, that sort of thing. So um, let's say I use it as a question about headache. Um, the simplest approach would be to just come up with a bunch of rules, right? That's what everybody would do. So a user might say, I don't know, I have a headache, uh, my head hurts, I don't know, my pain in head. Um, and they all these responses, uh, all these questions should get sort of the same response by our bot. Um, and we can come up with a bunch of rules, maybe even regular expressions and more sophisticated things um, uh, that work well for a very small fraction of the input data. So what you end up with is like some sort of high precision classifier that is basically very sure as, as soon as it fires, but has very low recall in that not a lot of things fit uh, to the patterns that you describe. Um, and it's obviously a bit boring. Um, but you could, 
go on with this pattern, right? You could, you could add more rules. So what causes migraine? Um, my leg hurts. I've injured my arm, injured my leg. All these different combinations, you could actually come up with a rule that describes this and fires then a certain response. Um, and this is the reason probably why the, the, the most popular um, chat script sort of libraries that you can, you can find online, like Rife script and chat script and things like that, pretty much fit this pattern. So you define some sort of pattern of, a, um, of a, uh, elements in your vocabulary um, that are combined in some way, um, maybe including some part of speech and things like that. Um, and using that, you can, you can come up with these rules. But pretty quickly, um, you reach the limit of this, right? So let's say even a moderately complicated query, like, I don't know, when I turned my neck the other day, my ear popped and it keeps ringing, what can I do? It's very unlikely that you define a rule specifically for this case, right? Also, it's quite unlikely that you wrote a rule that is generic enough to fit this case because it involves a lot of things and a lot of relations. Um, there's simply no way in advance that you, 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 you know how the people will ask about things. Um, and so you basically never have enough rules in your set to actually do anything useful. What you need um, is an additional level. So uh, after the high precision low recall classifier, you need something that sort of catches the ones where, where, where you're not unsure about things. Um, and that produces a response still at some sort of some moderately high quality. Um, but the question is, so, so how, how do you do this, right? Because we somehow established that we can't use rules for this, so we need to use something else. Uh, we need to make sure that, the, the, that it, it sort of works for the majority of the inputs that we, we give it, um, and um, that we can sort of easily use it. Right? So um, what are the challenges there? So we need to generalize to unknown stuff, because we don't know it. Um, we need to deal with messy inputs, so we, we have bad grammar, things like that. Um, and we only have a limited amount of annotated data. So we're not Google or whatever, so we, we don't have millions and millions of examples. We maybe have thousands and thousands of examples. But that is certainly not enough to build like a very sophisticated machinery. Um, so what do we do? Ideally, <coughs> um, ideally, we want something akin to the word vectors that we saw earlier. So we, we, we would like something that has some sort of high dimensional embedding space, right? And uh, we, we want to take, take our sentence and put it somewhere in the embedding space, right? Um, so I missed my pill, what should I do? Would lie somewhere there. Um, a similar query, like my girlfriend forgot her contraception, would sort of ideally lie in a sort of vicinity that is close by. So we can sort of, sort of see that they, those two are similar. And some other query, like I hope my elbow being tennis or something, um, should lie ideally in a completely different space in this. Um, and <laughs> it's actually a surprisingly powerful method for this and something that I would recommend you all try at home is to just use the mean word vector. Uh, it sounds a bit silly, but if you take the sentence and you just split it into words, right, and you look up all the words in your, in your model and you just use the mean word vector, so meaning you, you sum over the word vectors and you divide by the norm uh, to like, uh, divide by the length to normalize it then this would pretty much do what we just asked it to do, right? They actually papers with funny titles like the, the um, uh, a tough to beat baseline, which is pretty much just this approach with a little bit more finesse. But I would highly recommend you try this at home. Um, ideally, when we have this, so we have this high dimensional space, uh, we have some sort of sensible arrangement of queries, then uh, we would just say, train a sort of very simple model that says this part of the space should go to this content um, and these other parts of the spaces should go to other places of content. Right? So it's really super, na super nearly naive to, to, to propose a model like this, but it, it works surprisingly well in practice, as I can maybe show you now. Let's see. So my nice NCOS interface. So this is like a a very simple version of a, of a chatbot that will just take one question and will provide you with a couple of different options for content that it thinks is relevant for your question. Okay. And um, can everybody read this, by the way? Yeah. Um, and the way it works is that it, uh, it breaks up the sentence into tokens and generates this sentence level embedding. And then there's some sort of simple decision model at the top. And it has around 1,000 different content that it can deliver. So let, let's just try. So uh, I don't know. Let's try this example from the slides. Mr. Papil, what sh should I do? Right. And in this case, the bot proposes that I, I look at this content 
uh, missing contraceptive pill, and you could think that then, okay, then the bot in the real life would say, so you type it in, and the bot would say, uh, forgetting to take a contraceptive pill is not necessarily cause a problem. La -di -da -di -da. Uh, we can try a different one, so very helpful. Um, I don't know, I, I have a cramp in my legs, um, which interestingly goes to muscle cramps. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's some sense in this. Um, let's go for the one. So muscle cramps are very common. I wonder what the first one was, uh, anyway. Um, uh, so um, you, you guys, any, anybody, any volunteers? Question? Come on, guys. That's a good point. Negation is really, really hard. Um, so the problem is, so, okay. I can't feel my leg. <laughs> <laughs> Restless. Restless leg. It's like close enough, really. <laughs> but um, no, the, point you the point you mentioned with, can't I can't see. <laughs> this is not in production. <laughs> Thank God, it's not in production. Well, at least everybody knows this is not scripted now. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, d I wouldn't like any of that. <laughs> I can't see my glasses. For some reason, it wants to send you to. It, 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 does, it doesn't think. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. I can't sleep. That's much nicer. That sounds actually like a query that people might have. Of course, not many people that cannot see will use the application. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in this case, the I can't sleep actually goes to insomnia and improving poor sleep, which is good. Um, but you can, you can easily trick these models, right? So, so as I said, this is the, the decision on where to put the question in terms of content is driven by some data that we have. Um, and everything that is not in your data obviously will lead somewhere. Right? Um, and I can promise you that if you type that into our app, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't recommend uh, uh, that content to you. <laughs> but it's just, a, um, this is really naive, right? This is like 50 lines of Python uh, that, that r runs this model. And the, the training is like, you, you, can, you can do that in like an afternoon to, bu to build this sort of engine. So I just wanna, wanna, wanna say that this, the assigning content and potential pathways to users coming into your chatbot is potentially really easy if, you, if you're able to exploit the, 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 the word vectors that you already have on file, basically that you can just download from the web, that incorporate all this lingu like, linguistic, like linguistics, all the prior knowledge about the world around us. So you don't, you don't actually need to have that much training data to build something that is relatively powerful because you already have this generalization ability automatically built into your model. Right. Let's get, it, get, get out of here. <laughs> you can back to this later if you got one. Um, so. Right. <coughs> so, um, right. Um, initially, I wanted to talk more about chatbots, but um, there's actually um, uh, one thing that we recently released uh, that I think is a bit more exciting uh, right now, which is uh, on multilingual word vectors. So, um, so far, I've been just talking about monolingual word vectors. So uh, it basically only makes sense to compare the similarity between two words if they are in, from the same language, right? If you train it on the same corpus. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it really sort of doesn't make sense. So um, there's a lot of interest, though, for multilingual word vectors. So meaning things where I can compare two words in the same language, but also compare two words across two languages, right? Um, and um, so. To give you some intuition on how, how this could be done, uh, I want you to, 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 to start with this question. So the, the first question is, so let's say, uh, let's say we take the same data and we train word to vec or whatever method you use for these word vectors. We train, train on it twice with different random seeds. And what would happen? Okay. And I want to give you an analogy. So let's see. Let's say there's some undiscovered Pacific Island that I'm interested in, right? Um, and uh, I take, pick two people. Uh, they land on different beaches on that island. Um, and I give them some simple measurement tools, right? So they can measure distance and angles and things like that. And I give them a task, draw a map, OK? And the island is sort of big enough that they never meet. So they can never talk to each other about the maps that they draw. Um, what would happen? 
So if you can measure distance and angles, uh, it's perfectly reasonable that you end up with a map that, that is reasonable, right? The map itself, the coastlines between the two maps will sort of match. Um, also, the maps are self-consistent, so the two monuments basically in, uh, on the islands on the, the right map uh, will have sort of the same similar uh, relationship between each other than the, the, the same monuments on the other map. Um, but there will be, thank you, um, since I didn't give them a compass, there will be some sort of random orientation between the two, right? Because they have no way of turning off. So intuitively, what we can do is just rotate the maps, right? So we can just do this. Ta-da. Um, and what we introduce is some sort of, the, the, the maps itself are still the same. They, the pairwise relationships within each of the maps is still the same. But we can now actually say that this point in this map actually refers to this point in this map. It sounds very basic, but um, the key thing is that this analogy holds for word vectors. So if you, um, if you would train word to vec on the same data set twice with different random seeds, that is basically akin to landing on the different beaches. The, the measurement tools that you use to create the map are basically your learning algorithm. And the, the, the island itself is your data, right? Um, and what we just established basically is to say that we say, okay, we need to do a rotation, which basically means that there, there, there should be some sort of an orthogonal linear transformation between these two vector spaces that minimizes some sort of norm, which is sort of the, the, the alignment of these coastlines. Um, and crucially, what happens if we do this for diff two different languages? Right? So right now we're just speaking about single language, right? same data, but we previously said that the, um, the word vectors given enough data will sort of model the world around us. Right? And if we look at two languages, let's say English and Italian, um, they both still describe the same world around us. So the word vectors trained on English and word vectors trained on Italian should, in the end, describe the same world around us. So the islands are the same, even if they are two languages. So we can actually, intuitively speaking, take a vector space from English and a vector space from Italian and just apply this orthogonal transformation um, and we will be able to align the two vector spaces of the two languages. And that is actually something that actually works. So we, uh, this paper from us from, uh, that we um, came out last week uh, on Isilar. Um, and in this paper, we basically showed, we proved that this transformation should be orthogonal, right? Um, and we show that there's actually an analytical solution if you have a dictionary of points that are basically the same. So think of monuments on those maps that are mapped to each other. Then there's an analytical solution that gives you the optimal transformation uh, between these two vector spaces. Um, so here's an example. So on the left-hand side are word vectors of English and Italian. Um, so uh, let's see, blue is English, red is Italian. And you see that before the alignment, they're sort of a bit random, right? Um, while after the alignment, um, you see that document is close to documento, cucinar is close to cooking, uh, passager is close to passageri, musica close to musica. So it makes sense. They not lie on exactly on top of each other, but the, the words that relate to each other will, will lie in sort of a similar region of this embedding space, meaning we can actually do the same tricks that we discussed earlier, meaning this mean word vector and so forth, with this transformed vector space of multiple languages. And this is something you can actually download. Um, so we, um, Facebook recently published uh, initially 90 languages. Uh, so word, pre-trained word vectors for 90 languages. Uh, they recently uh, increased that number to 294, I think. Um, and we created a dictionary using Google Translate of, for like 78 of the 90 languages at the time. Um, and we used the method that we described in the paper to align all of these different languages with English. Um, and in this, this repo, you can actually download all the, all the alignment matrices and a bit of code that helps you align the, the vector spaces. Um, so you can, you can actually build multilingual text classifiers without much effort. Thanks. Um, so I promise some, this is the only Python code I got, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so just to illustrate, so there's, uh, we have this fast vector, you can download this. Um, you can just load these Facebook word vectors, in this case, French and Russian. Um, and um, you can cal calculate the similarity uh, for these two words, right? And in this case, the, the similarity is sort of in the middle, right? It's neither very similar nor dissimilar. While if you apply this transformation that we created to map 
these two languages to English, then you can actually see that the, the similarity between these two words increases quite a lot, and that's good because they both mean cat. <laughs> it's not true? Yeah, because the first one is cat, like a conversation. No, that, that's, that's uh, French. Ah, French. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank God, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you can, you can look at the pairwise sort of uh, translation precision for individual words across all these different languages. So the, the, the source language is in the, in the rows and the target language in the columns. And uh, the language is obviously aligned with itself, right? But there are some, some really surprises. So if you, if you align everything to English, you see that some pairs, like off-diagonal pairs, actually work really, really well. So you have um, one example is Russian and Ukrainian, for example, works with like 90% precision. Uh, it will make sense, but, but to, to the computer, it's just words, right? It's like they don't know that the, the words are grammar, even spelled the same. The same. The language is the same, and the origins are similar. So how, how is the word rationalized, for example? Um, it's, um, I, 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 I don't know. I have to look it up. It's too, too tiny to read, even for me. I'll put it on here. Um, it's, it's a good question, right? Um, I'm not sure if it's down to linguistic uh, similarity or if it's down to just that the Wikipedias of both languages have exactly the same content because the people that translate from one to the other are sort of the same people. So uh, we're still investigating what sort of the, the reason behind this. So I'm, I'm at the end, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so um, thanks, that was it. Uh, we're hiring uh, machine learning scientists, engineers. If you're keen on working on cool stuff, come to us. Also Python devs, download the app. Thank you. Uh, doc to back. Um, so um, we, we, have, we haven't tried doc to back. We tried other approaches. Um, so there are a bunch of different sentence level embeddings that, that do work. But the, uh, so in my experience, what actually works best is, is an RNN, right? Um, but it's sort of a trade off between the, the amount of effort that you put in, the speed at which you can do the inference, and the, the sort of improvement of quality that you get. So there, there are obviously better ways of doing it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I didn't repeat. I didn't repeat the question. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, I also find fascinating that on your uh, many forms of answers, rational to function is really close to suicide. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there are there are multiple. The, the, oh yeah, um, the, the question is if we use RNNs uh, uh, in production and word to back in production. Um, so um, the 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 chatbot that we I, I can't exactly go into the detail how it works, right? But the uh, overall the chatbot that we have uh, combines multiple of these approaches, right? So so even though machine learning people always tell you that you can always do everything with machine learning, you will always have a bunch of rules as well. So we have a bunch of rules uh, at the start, right? To just to, to capture cases where we definitely show. Um, we have RNNs deployed in production um, based on word to vec um, And what they do is they decide basically uh, which path a, a, a user should take through, through like our chat experience. And we have additional models like the one I, I just showed you that, that do uh, like information retrieval basically. Um, and there, there we use a variety of different models. Uh, including word to vec as well. Like word to vec works really well. Seriously. Thank you. The question is on the feedback of the doctors on the chatbot. Um, so we, we can't deploy the chatbot unless it's medically validated. So we have to convince the doctors that it's safe, um, which which is a challenge. Um, but the 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 we, we managed to convince the doctors to deploy an RNN based chatbot. So um, they are happy with it. Um, in many cases, if, if you build a system that has a sort of probabilistic part to it, um, you need to make sure that even, uh, first of all, that, the, that it fails gracefully. So if you think of a confusion matrix of all your classes, that it always confuses with other compared to confusing between the different classes. Does that make sense? And you can achieve that through like thresholds and like marginal position and things like that. Um, um, and then you need to design sort of the path, the experience, so what the chatbot says to be safe in these cases where you fail. 
Um, but that is as much an interface problem as it is a, it is, is a technical problem. Um, so, yeah. So, so you need a, you need more more examples. Oh, yeah. The question is if we need uh, uh, basically if if we need many examples for the rotation um, of the two vector spaces. Uh, so the the dimensionality of these vector spaces I should have mentioned this is is usually around the 300, 500, 600 mark. Um, so you can determine like the, the it's basically fully determined by a couple of hundred uh, examples. But yeah, there, there would be an issue if you just have 50 examples. Uh, it probably wouldn't work. I'd say that's something we're working on right now. Um, it is. It is a bit difficult to have a. As I mentioned, the the, the medical validation of a chatbot um, is doable. Um, if you if you have uh, oh yeah the question sorry uh, the the question uh, was if if the chatbot that we deployed learns from in the the user over time that that it associates some sort of chronic conditions maybe with somebody asking the same thing over and over again um, I think for the for the actual decision uh, where it goes through the system that is sort of secondary nearly um, but there there should be another process over time that looks at at the the the, your experience with the with the app that then maybe highlights a certain risk of um, chronic problems, um, and that's sort of uh, so. What you sort of want is like a nearly like a distributed representations for patients that takes all this into account, right? All the different experiences that you have with the app that is sort of sort of make you similar. Um, yeah. So uh, regarding sorry, sorry the, regarding the the. Um, the validation of what I mentioned earlier. If you have a bot that is too contextualized, that that where there are too many too many ways of getting into one pathway, it becomes very difficult to validate that pathway from a medical perspective because there are just so many different ways and can you you can enter into it. Um, so at, at the moment we're still we're still working on that to be honest. Um, yeah, having a chatbot is novel, but I know there are some online self-help systems already, and I just wondered have you managed to outperform them? I think, I think about the NHS one; it always recommends you talk to GPs. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so the the question is if we evaluate against like online support forums and things like that. Um, so regarding the NHS triaging, you mean the one 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 service, I guess. Um, they, they 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 do have an issue that they're a bit over, overly cautious uh, in terms of triaging. Um, there is there has actually been a deployment of our triaging system f uh, as a substitute for NHS one 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 in London uh, over the last couple of months. Um, so we. Um, we do have a triage system that performs at least as well, at least in our evaluation so far, um, uh, and is a bit less. Uh, well, it's it's hard to say. Um, it it won't always send you to the GP. I mean, people always, uh, people think that our app will always recommend you to go to the GP, right? That's a typical criticism that that you, when you have a chatbot and you have an interaction and in the end it says tell, tells you to call a GP, right? But on average, it's more expensive for us if you actually talk to a GP. We actually want you to not talk to a GP if we can. Um, so the, the the question is if we use the the video consultations uh, to to improve our uh, or increase our training set. Um, we don't do that at the moment. Um, there there are some uh, challenges regarding information governance and uh, privacy and security. Um, so we we actually don't have immediate access necessarily to the recordings of of of, of the, the the video of the consultation. Right? They would first have to go through like a like a quite stringent anonymization process, um, and it. So, so we at the moment we don't we we don't not using that yet. The, um, we basically have a lot of in-house doctors that that help us with an initial data collection, and we have some of the services that we offer um, also involve speaking to a, to a clinician via text. Um, so that is a, an obvious source for for training data for us. Uh, 
So um, uh, fast text works particularly well for, for, for languages that have like composited words. So the, the, the way fast text works that is, that is different to Wotovac is that, that beyond just learning a, a representation for the words, it tries to, to learn representations for basically trigrams or n-grams in general, um, where the mean over those n-grams is sort of similar to the, to the representation of the words that, that uh, is made up of these trigrams. Um, and what that leads to is that, that it's, it's better at like words that are rare, uh, which is pretty much all the cases for languages where words can be freely, like German, where you, where you can just put lots of words in, in a sequence. And it might be a combination that you have not seen that often in your training set. You would still have a good prior on what the, what the representation should be. Um, but then, yeah, it's fast. But these are, these are um, at, at inference time, they're all the same. It's just a, it's just a hash, right? So you just look up a, a value in a hash. So uh, at inference time, there's no benefit in terms of speed. Yes. Thank you.